So when we are examining a shoulder patient, as you can clearly see, we have a, a volunteer. Uh, for a male patient, it's never an issue. Uh, the patient must be undressed from the waist upwards. The real issue comes when you're examining a female patient. So obviously the essential requirement is that you must have a chaperone or one of the attendants of the female patient. And what I do in my practice is that I just cover the chest with a bed sheet. So imagine, I mean, the easiest way to tell a lady is that uh, imagine that you're wearing a strapless dress. So both the shoulders must be fully exposed and this is roughly the position you would want when you're injecting the shoulder as well. Unlike the knee, hip and the ankle in which you would inject with the patient in the lying down position, shoulders are always injected with the patient in the sitting position. So get used to properly exposing uh, the female patient. For the males, of course, it is not an issue. And again, most of the shoulder diseases can be very easily diagnosed just by inspection. So uh, when you're inspecting the shoulder, always start from the front, look at the sternoclavicular joint, follow the contour of the clavicle. You can very clearly see the supraspinous fossa here. You can inspect the bulk of the anterior deltoid, the lateral deltoid, the posterior deltoid. And towards the back, you see the infraspinous fossa. Atrophy in these regions is very easily visible because you have the other side for comparison. One good thing is that most shoulder pathologies are seldom bilateral. So the other normal side offers a very useful comparison whenever you want to, let's say, diagnose a rotator cuff problem in which you are expecting atrophy of the rotator cuff. Unlike a frozen shoulder where there is little to no atrophy of the rotator cuff or the deltoid. And again, the other thing to understand when you are doing shoulder examinations is the concept of movements in the scapular plane. Now, if you observe, if I keep my pointer parallel to the spine of scapula, uh, you see that it makes a certain angle and this angle varies from person to person and it generally ranges from 25 degrees to 40 degrees. And uh, therefore, when you want to get a true AP X-ray of the shoulder, you either ask the X-ray beam to come perpendicular to the scapular plane. So this is the scapular plane and this is therefore the perpendicular to the scapular plane or you rotate your patient back by a sufficient amount so that uh, the x-ray beam if it comes from front to back it is perpendicular to the scapular plane so that is how you take a true AP view of the shoulder trust me it is more difficult than what it sounds most uh, radiology centers don't give you a true AP view you must accompany your patient and train the radiologist to take a proper AP view a certain standard nomenclature uh, when it comes to movements I'll just drop the pointer down so the movement perpendicular to the scapular plane is known as the abduction movement. So abduction, adduction. The movement which happens in front, this is known as the elevation in the scapular plane. The movement which happens behind is extension. So these are the common movements and when you check rotations, you generally report rotations in two positions. So the upper arm is adducted you rotate the arm out, this is obviously external rotation, and then you rotate the arm in, this is internal rotation. So that's external rotation in adduction, internal rotation in adduction. Now you also need to examine the same rotations in 90 degrees of abduction. So this is the zero position when it comes to 90 degrees of abduction. So that is the amount of external rotation in the 90 degree abducted position. This is the amount of internal rotation in the 90 degrees adducted position. What is the end point? When the scapula starts to move. So all, you would note that I will always keep one of my hands, usually the non-dominant hand on top of the scapula. If I'm examining his other shoulder, the left shoulder, I'll keep my right hand on top of the scapula and do the same movements. So you must always have a controlling hand to know that when the scapula starts moving. So this is similar to the concept of squaring the pelvis in a hip assessment. So when the pelvis starts moving, you know that you have reached the limit of that particular movement, be it, be it abduction, adduction, or internal or external rotation. Uh, so the pelvis, uh, what it does to the hip, the same as, as the scapula, what it does to the shoulder. So understand these concepts of movement and you need to measure them using a goniometer. So obviously when you're using a goniometer to measure rotation, you need to the zero position. This is the zero position for rotations in uh, with the upper arm in adduction. And similarly, this is the zero position for rotations when the upper arm is 90 degrees abducted. Because a lot of shoulder diseases show characteristic patterns of movement restriction and uh, these become important from that perspective.